The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. First Centure investors believe actively targeting Australia's growth engine. High quality growing companies listed on the ASX is the secret to beating the market. Since 1993, every wholesale fund managed by its Australian equities growth team has outperformed the share market over the long term. They believe high quality growing companies can power tax effective, geared, X20 and concentrated portfolios. Thinking about new ways to target Australian share market growth? Think first centier investors. Past performance not indicative of future performance. Net of fees as at August 2024. G'day, how's it going? What do you know, Striker Like Clayton here from Ensemble. Got a bit of a fun one today. A buddy of mine recently kicked off a business with a business partner. And so, Naz, Julian, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you, Clay. Yeah. So, we met, I figured it's probably yeah. the best. So, we met at a XY event, I think 2016, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Might have even been earlier. Yeah. Were you, your first exposure to XY, was that? at Dalton House in 2016, or did you come to one earlier than that? Yeah, it was actually at Dalton House, and yes. we ran into each other, and we were yeah. two young yeah. uh, professionals in the industry. We were just trying to find our way and, and, and learn about everything. I remember uh, the event pretty well. It was it was a, a lot of – it was a pretty much a boys' club. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and there was a lot of people standing around and, and we were kind of the only young guys in the room and, and we kind of found each other and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And and I guess the, the journey kicked off from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because um, I still got those photos from those very first meetings and uh, it was, we were, we were so early in our journey that, you know, anyone that turned up to anything, we were like, hey, uh, why are you here? Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh my God, someone actually, we, you know, we put in so much work to do this thing. And so the Dalton House event, I think we had 200 people turn up. I was I was running my financial planning business. I was writing a book at the time. Um, and I basically did a lot of that work to get that event going. And it almost destroyed me, but it was so nice to have people who turned up. And then, so, you know, we, we've always just kept in contact since yeah. then. And then about, I don't know, a little while ago, you sort of turned up and said, hey, we've launched ASO. Um, what do you reckon we should do with our tech stack? And what do you reckon we should do with this, that, and the other? And I realized like both of you guys are really experienced financial planners and you're on this awesome new part of your journey. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, hey, over a bottle of wine, I think this decision was made. <laughs> Let's do a podcast. So, uh if it, and maybe Julian, uh, let us know how in your mind did you go from being a financial planner to hey, I want to set up ASO with with Nas. That's a really good, uh, really good question. Um, good segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nas and I, um, you know, we we started um, at quite a young age um, in in the advice space. And uh, we had a very similar kind of run to, you know, to the uh, the support roles through to power planning roles through to uh, the advice role. And we, you know, I think we're quite blessed in being in environments where, you know, mentors and professionals were, you know, taught us um, a lot of great things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a point. Um, where we kind of looked at each other and we said, you know, hang on, there's a, there's a lot of things, um, you know, in the industry that, you know, we see the future, um, mm. you know, kind of looking like, if you will. And we, we looked at each other and said, well, why don't we just, um, just do this for ourselves? We've got these ideas, these, uh, you know, these thoughts and let's, let's, you know, let's give it a crack. We, we aligned on many levels, um, you know, personal, uh, you know, similar age, um, similar 
kind of or similar experience as I said before. Yep. But similar ambitions, and, and I think that that's what you really need to be able to partner up with someone. You need to be able to um, kind of have a very similar vision and very similar. Not always ways of doing things, but it's maybe ways of looking at things and ways of uh, and how you you know your goals align. Well, certainly purpose, right? There's got to be purpose. an alignment in, in the purpose. So, would you guys say the purpose um, has been how you can do things differently, or how you can do how you can serve clients in a way that you maybe couldn't fully do in you know in previous roles? What sort of was the purpose, I guess, of of your advice practice? What what's kind of like the mission statement, if you will, before ISO? Clay, I think there's three things that we nailed down on uh, being, uh, and this is why it's called ASO, right? So it stands for Advice Service Outcome. Uh, I think it stands at the core of our advisory principles. So it stands for being advice focused, uh, so service orientated, and outcome driven. And I think the three pillars that underline those things is, you know, strategic, unbiased, holistic. And those really big words, but we really truly aligned together on that vision. Our mindset was very similar. We approached every client with that core principles, with that core process. We did things differently. You know, I, I take sometimes the, the 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 top down, sometimes Julian takes the bottom up and we meet in the middle and, and we discuss and we think. But I think that, you know, if we take also a step back we also, you know, came from very similar backgrounds where, you know, both our families came here when we were kind of seven, eight years old. Um, you know, we were, we were, you know, first generation migrants coming through here. So for us, the, the, the family values align so much, you know, we, our, our values in the business is trustworthiness, having fun and, and, and almost building like a, like a family business for togetherness. And, yeah. And, you know, when we would work together, we, 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 we spent a lot of time together and we spoke about all these things together. And I think back to your point around uh, how the business works, I think, uh, you know, being goals-based and, and, and having those core principles allowed us to really look at the industry and ask ourselves, well, what's the best way to deliver this without constraints? And obviously, a lot of the stuff where, you know, there's there's licensing governance, there's there's teams and different things. And when you work in different environments, you you realize that everyone's got a different way of doing things. Yeah. You've got to cooperate with everyone. Uh, and ultimately led us to to thinking, well, we've got to, you know, we want to be here for the next 20 to 30 years. How do we build something that's meaningful, that's based on these principles where we can sit down and, and confidently say, look at someone in their eye and say, this is what we built. We're so proud of this. And this represents us. And, and I think- that's where the journey of 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 going out on for ourselves, um, that ambition, and and I think as you know, first generation migrants, every family kind of looks at that, and and, and you know, my dad runs a business, still does. My father in law runs a business for himself, and it was always in our in in, in my DNA to one day run a business. Um, so I think for for us both together, when we had that vision, that alignment, we we, we recognize that. Um, you know, you, we had to take the reins for ourselves, take control. And I think over that conversation you and I spoke about, it was very much around, well, if I started my own business, we join a license. You know, you, you do take control of your own destiny, but you're still governed by someone else, right? If you had a new idea, you had to propose it. And if you propose it, it had to be approved, it had to be taken up the ranks. And and pretty well, I remember you asked me, I said, well, if Guys are being crazy. You guys are going out for it yourself. You know, virtually you've got no clients. This is a big move. And we said, well, yeah, yeah we got no clients. We walked away from a, from a, I would call it a a, a, a great role uh, in the industry. Been working somewhere for ten years at a at, at a place that's taught us a lot uh, and and given us the podium to go out there and and, and really grow. So it was it was brave, and, and some people described it as courageous. But I think for us, it was, you know. Those vision, those values align, and we said we, we've got to do something. If we're going to be here for the next thirty years, we've got to build something. Mm. And, and to that point, we, we sat there and said, "Well," uh, and I remember we interviewed licensees, and, and they and they kept saying to us, "Well, what are your ideas? What do you want to do here? What do you want to do here?" And every time we proposed something, I said, "Well, look, that's not how we do things, or that's a really great idea. Let me note that down and see if." It works for everybody else. And I think that was one of the, the trigger points 
that we we spoke to one another and said, "Is is that really what we want to build for the next thirty years?" Well, that's really interesting. I um, so I've never heard that. That I'm sure other advisors have done this, but I've actually never s- sort of heard that sentence before. Which is, we interviewed licensees. Like that's a that's a really cool premise. And, and I'll say this: I listened to a podcast a couple of years ago of someone who started their own business. And um, I remember I was sitting there, and uh, it was a it was a female advisor. I, I completely I, I don't remember who she is, but she said those words. She said, "I, I joined an advisory uh, a, a licensee, and three months into the journey, I asked them, "Hey, do you have like a template for authorities to collect, or uh, what about right. this and what about that?" She said, and then and obviously the interview asked her, "If you had anything different, what would you do?" And she said, "I would a hundred percent interview." people and interview yeah. licensees and that gave me an idea of saying well as much as also when you bring you know when we were uh, uh, you know working previously we were hiring people and as much as they're interviewing you're interviewing them they're interviewing you sure yeah right? and the core principles and the values and, and and for us it was very much about that we we had a strong vision yeah and and to add to that i think that that goes with anything i think uh if you're gonna um start a business for you know, for the um, sake of this conversation, you want to you want to kind of do your due diligence on everything. Yeah, if it's a licensee, if it's your tech, if it's your your people, if it's your your whatever your, your software, whatever it is, uh, you know. And that's what I think that uh, together we we did really really well. We um we really weighed up every option to go. Well, what's going to be best? And even inevitably, some things. Some I, I, to this day, I think we've done everything right. Honestly. Well, but, we, but, but, but we're aware that things, um, there's always going to be things that will go wrong in some senses. That's just the nature of, of what we do. But, but so far, um, because of, because of our due diligence and, and our processes, I think, um, yeah, we've, we've made some really good choices. I, I think one thing we agreed on from the for very first days of, of, of being in business together, and we're so lucky that we found each other. That's what a lot of people say to us. And, uh, you know, we are very lucky to have found each other so aligned. But, from the very first day in business, we had this saying, it was have strong opinions, but hold them lightly. Yeah. So there's a pretty popular sentence. I'm sure you might have heard of it, which is strong beliefs loosely held. Yeah. Yep. Which, Similar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, which is really counterintuitive, right? Like go hard on something until someone proves to you otherwise, in which case maybe I was wrong. And, and, yeah. and, we, yeah. and we became champions of certain things and, and that's what allowed us, one explored certain ideas and the other one was back to report, and then we both, right? You know, we're able to question one another and and, and almost provide like a, a third a dimensional opinion and say, well, what did you? F-? And, and almost well, having that opinion, it makes you then go, okay, I didn't think about it that way. Let me go back and ask that critical question because sometimes right. I would say to Jules, that's really that's a really awesome solution. Let now let me question you like a client. Yeah, and. And I think that's what we're always done. We're always uh, uh, focusing on the client experience. And I think that's ultimately what drove us to running our own business. We wanted to control the client experience. We saw how much tech was embracing the industry and how much change is coming. And and ultimately being able to control the client experience drove us to being self-licensed, you know, interviewing licensees, understanding their process, um, you know, their allegiances, their partnerships ultimately made us- Their restrictions- that's a good way of putting it, <laughs> made us decide that if we wanted to control the client journey and ultimately we have this this core principle about our business and it's the trust formula, right? And the trust formula is this. It's credibility plus reliability plus intimacy over self-orientation equals trust. Awesome. Right? So what it all stands for is credibility is that's your knowledge base, right? So I would say 99% of advisors – should meet that, right? Your knowledge base with what the industry said. So everyone's credibility should be there. Reliability is, is something that you decide on a daily basis on whether to show up, right? Whether you're going to do what you say you're going to do. You know, I had a client always say to me, he said, it's not the big wins you've posted on the board for me. It's the small things you've done. Turn up on time, um, you know, Send me that email when you told me you're going to send me that email. Even if you sent it at 11.59 p.m., <laughs> you did do it that day. He said, those little, he said, acts of kindness. All, all the traits of genuine care. Yeah. And, and that reliability. 
builds that trust. And then the last part is self uh, is, is is intimacy. And I think what intimacy actually really stands for in that in that equation is allowing someone to feel emotionally uh, available or comfortable to really showcase who they are and and really uh, communicate all the things that are going on in their life and what help they actually need. Sometimes you know, we talk about another aspects in life where people don't ask for help and it's so hard in finance to, for someone actually genuinely to open up to. And I think that intimacy with clients, once they feel emotionally ready and, and available to communicate to you and with you've got your credibility, your reliability and your intimacy, ultimately the formula gets formed over self-orientation. Sure. Right? And self-orientation is, you know, are you in it for yourself or are you in it for your client? Right. And everyone in this industry should say, I'm in it for the client. Sure. But I feel like there's always asterisks, right? It's not about me making money or you making money. It's about ultimately self-orientation comes around about the fact that do you have your client first? Now, if when we then kind of take it to this position around the business, well, if I'm restricted with the CRM I'm using or the tools I'm using or different things in, in the advice process I'm using that doesn't work for my client, am I still about my client? Or is there self-orientation around that aspect? Mm. And if you don't have a self-orientation in any aspect, well, the whole formula, you can be credible, reliable, have intimacy with the client. But if it's about you, then you're never going to have trust. Right. Right. So it has to be really about the client. And that's where we continuously talked about that and said, well, that formula means a lot to us. And if, if this is in the client's best interest and that's the journey we want our clients to travel on, we ultimately want to have that control to be able to deliver that. Yeah, so it basically started with what services do you want to provide and how much value do you want to deliver to a client? Mm. And then you kind of backwards engineered from that. And I would imagine you're probably still in the process of tweaking this, right? It's not, Yes. I mean, I launched a business a few years ago, uh, a financial planning business a few years ago. I, I'm, I'm no longer practicing, but... It's kind of an ongoing process, right? It's not like it's fully ever solved. Um, and I and I speak to very, um, I, I would say, successful financial planners with which large firms, and they're still that you know like changing quite big things because you know you kind of make a decision based on one set of one set of decision decisions, and then the something changes, and then all of a yeah. sudden yeah. it doesn't actually make sense to do a particular thing. So. Yeah, it's not like you're ever 100% um, finished in this area, but I would imagine probably a lot of the large rocks are now in place for you guys. Yes, yes. And like you're saying, uh, there's never an end to tweaking your processes and, and the way you do things and what you use and so on. But yes, we um, we we spent a lot of time um, making sure that the big rocks are in place. Um, and look, some, some rocks, some big rocks will probably shift over the next 12 months or, or, or 24 months, depending on, on, on our progress. Um, but yes, we've got what we need in place to be able to, um, service, um, you know, our clientele the best way that we can. And that, that, you know, we, it's interesting because we had a really, uh, in the past, we've, we've had a really, really good experience of different types of clients. And where we where we are today is we um, we want to look after. We, I guess you could say target market as 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 the word for it. Um, being clients between roughly between the ages of thirty to fifty, um, who have really strong cash flow um, and who just don't know how to build wealth or don't have the time for it. Right, mm-hmm. and it's and you know that's that's relatively um, simple in nature, but that's also that answers your question of before, you know, our, our purpose and and what we're doing this for of the birth of ASO Wealth. And we believe that with the rocks we've put in place that we can service that type of market really, really well and almost be kind of a project manager or or a personal CFO for them. Um, and I say that, but, you know, we've had retiree clients come to us and, of course, we- Naturally. We, yeah, that's right. Naturally, they're, they're, they're a demographic that really, really need the help. And, yes. You know, we're really good at it and we, we've, um, and we have uh, retiree clients that we help. So, we'll, you know, we'll always be, um, you know, have our doors open to, to anybody that needs help. Um, but, you know, if we're going to go out and advertise ourselves, that's, you know, the, what I mentioned before is the type of people that, um, you know, that will target. But- um, but yeah, and and with the changing landscape of 
of AI technology, of the way that we do things. That's why I say that some rocks are going to change. You've, you've always got to expect that processes or tech or whatever it is, is going to change because if you think that you're set and set and forget, um, you know, we've learned already that um, <laughs> it's just not, not good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, what's really interesting is, goodness, about 10 years ago when I started my practice, um, I was after a demographic very similar to, to, to you guys and um, – and I had a friend, uh, Naomi Christopher, and she, she, I don't know if she came up with the term, but I'm going to credit her with it regardless. So, this is a, a while ago, but it was, she says to me, high, in, high earning, not rich yet, Henry. Yes. And I was like, that is, that's a phenomenal, uh, that's a phenomenal term. And, and, um, and it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, all these years later, it is still, I would say not a massively common sort of um, demographic that people are going after. But at the same time, the companies that do, they're finding success because these types of people are a growing cohort. Yep. And it's and the way that I sort of used to think of, think of it is the industry, I'll call it the industry before I call it the profession. So the industry where it sort of came from in terms of, you know, a birth out of, you know, risk insurance and that kind of thing. Um, it was really about large sums. So, it was a large sum of insurance or a large sum mm. of investment or a large sum of mortgage. Yeah. It was these large sort yeah. of sums. Yeah. And then as the profession has sort of come into play, it's become more about profit and loss and money turning around and money in, money out. And so, it's not that those large sums have gone away. It's just that's now- not the entirety of the uh, of the profession. So, in terms of, uh, I, I would call it the evolution of the advice profession. What kind of other positive evolutions have you seen, or, or dare I say, what have you historically seen mistakes in the industry that make you want to say, well, we want to do it our way, and we want to do it this way, and we feel like we can get a better result? It's a great question, Clay. I think. If we go back to the clients and what clients ask us and what clients say to us, sometimes we have people come to us and say, we're not really big. We don't have a lot of money to invest. Um, we don't feel like we're fit for an advisor, but we're looking for one. And we always find that a bit shocking um, that people say that. They say, well, um, I, uh, I I know enough, but uh, I, I just want, you know, I've spoken to someone before and I just feel like um, they're talking about, a portfolio or a solution or, 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 you know, risk profile or something like that. And I always get shocked. And if I take a step back around what you were saying, uh, the Henry clients is our solution to intergenerational transfer of wealth. Mm. Because ultimately, it's the centers of influence. We're, we're trying to work with, with people who are ultimately, it's not about, uh, you know, high earners, it's about high achievers, mm. right? Who people who genuinely want to take control of, of what they're doing in their life and, and really put a lot of structure around it because ultimately what we do is is strategy first, right? And really take the client through the journey of the strategy and understanding before we talk about any product, any solution, anything, it's about the strategy, it's about you, it's about your income expenses and then the strategy that you can implement behind the scenes and create the, the structure, you know, some people just call it the structure. Sure. And, and a lot of people think, you know, accounting structures, but it's really ultimately your your life structure and what you're trying to do. And and I, and I think what we try to build, what we try to communicate to people, it's about uh, wealth dimension. You know, money's not everything. It's what you can do with it. Yes. Right? What it's going to allow you to do. And if we take that mindset, it allows us to explore in, in different avenues. And, and I think there's a lot of service offerings out there that are, uh, uh, you know, I think the biggest mistakes in the industry that are being made right now is people are being priced out of advice. Everyone talks about it. Yeah, but yeah. It's upfront fees where we've got we've got a we've we've got an economy that is you know uh, hot, I would say hot. <laughs> yes. and, and a lot of people don't want to part ways with five to ten thousand dollars after meeting someone, and, and in seven days paying that invoice. Yeah, people you know don't have enough. I believe in, in what we do in our trust formula. We don't have enough time to showcase our credibility, our reliability, and intimacy yeah. in such a small amount of time. We really take the time with our clients. We might have, you know, in the initial meetings, we might take 
you know, sometimes three to six meetings to wow. really, yeah, okay, yeah, really take the time to understand and build the strategy and go yeah. back and forth, and obviously you get paid along the way. Sure, it's not, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 not a free service, but once people really understand that you're in it for the strategy and understanding them, yeah, it, it becomes a difference. I think the other point that I think a lot of advice firms, or I, I think advice firms, are limited. All the mistakes are being made based on, I would say, the restrictions of certain licensees. Uh, it's it's about they come out and they listen to the client. They say words like holistic, holistic, holistic. But in the background, the advisor's thinking about, well, where can I place this client? Which managed account can I place them in? What risk profile are they going to be in? What insurer am I going to write? Really thinking about the ending for the client where they're going to have – where they're going to place them mm. rather than thinking about, well, hold on, so I, this client's not asking me about managed accounts. This client isn't asking me about right. uh, <laughs> risk profile or the yeah. insurer. They're asking me about something completely different. Of course. And really taking the time, I think you need to have the time and capacity and not be limited by all the other things to then start thinking about that and really just focus on the client and say, well, and that's where the pricing model's need to be adjusted for that and expectations i think expectations is everything right um you know we met an advisor that said well i don't charge upfront fees i said well that's really interesting so how do you charge he said well we'll, we we go through the process we tell them that the upfront fee is ten thousand dollars and then when they agree to everything we drop it and we put an ongoing uh Hmm. funds under management and and it's a quite large funds under management fee he said that's the success we find I said that for me, that's, you know, how, how do you really, uh, you know, how does clients find values as well? It, it's, it's free to join, but we, we, but to join us, you have to have a large funds under management. Sure. To your point. Yeah. So all these things, I just find that people find it so limiting to find advice. And ultimately, I don't know how they justify that trust formula, yeah. right? At what point is the self orientation coming into it or the, the firm's ideology coming into it, all the restrictions that the licensees are placing. The licensee says they don't have restrictions, but if if you're using a certain CRM, a certain tool, a certain this, a certain portfolio uh, solution or ideology, well, there is some type of self orientation. Yeah, uh, we believe so. I think um, that, that that's probably where the the industry has some shortcomings. Yeah, I mean. This it's really sort of two sides of the equation, right? There is what we want to achieve, and then there's how we are going to achieve it. Yeah. And then, and if I was to sort of take a step back and have a look at you guys, it's almost like now, as you're sort of like m- maybe a bit more focused on the 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 higher level, the the big picture, the top down sort of approach. And then Julian, and I could be wrong here, but you you definitely seem. Uh, more interested or maybe more capable just in that the how we're going to execute on this. I I Mm. remember when we caught up, you had some really good questions around technology and things like that. It was, you know, over my head, uh, you know, over my pay grade. and, 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 um, And I was really impressed with sort of even the ideas that you guys were putting forward and how you were going to, to deliver on that. And, and because your business is extraordinarily new, so you probably haven't had a chance to do this, but what kind of marketing, exists if any for you guys currently right now i'll this start podcast <laughs> uh, i'll start up you can you can add to it naz but uh look um yeah you 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 um you said it right if any because we um we're doing we look we haven't needed to mm. yet that's great it's it has been really really good and that's thanks to the word of mouth Word of mouth, yes, uh, is a, is is a big one, yep. and and the relationships in the industry with other financial services professionals, uh, the relationships that we've you know we've built along the way. Oh, these are like centers of influence. Yeah, excellent. yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, so you know, those two things alone have allowed um, you know a, an inflow of inquiries and an inflow of of um, you know people that we can help and that yep. we have been helping. Um, but we are um, kind of we are looking. Towards okay, well, what next? I won't like. Of course, you know we we're doing we're we're using uh, some social media yeah. uh, platforms, but we're yes. not religiously um, kind of going uh, crazy with it. Yeah, simply be, again because we haven't needed to. We've been busy enough um, 
otherwise. So I guess the the, the question is, uh, and this is where I'll shift over to Naz, but um, you know, the question is, how do we take the next step forward with marketing? Yeah, uh, and how do we kind of scale from here? Not that our mindset is all about scale, scale, scale. But um, inevitably, it's going to have to happen that we need help um, from someone or, or you know, that we need kind of resources to continue to meet the demand over the next, you know, 12 months. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, just with what Naz was saying before, mate, when you said we do three to six meetings to get across that, the trust, right? And then the credibility, the reliability and the um, intimacy. So, a lot of this terminology, um, I actually many years ago did this course called P- key person of influence mm-hmm. and um and a, a lot of these sort of uh concepts came through and, and you're exactly right not only i would say is the buying journey of everyone very long these days like since the advent of the internet right before the internet existed if yeah. you needed something you would open up the yellow pages right you'd yeah. go from problem to solution by turning a page, yep. right? But even if I'm looking at getting some plumbing done, I'm first jumping onto YouTube and being like, oh, man, yeah, 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 this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, oh, you know, this guy, oh, he's down the road from me. Oh, this is interesting. A couple of months. Oh, no, he's he knows what's going on, right? So, he's able to instill the credibility, reliability, and intimacy sort of ale, right? And, um, and so with you, is when you were mentioning it, um, this is one of the things that I certainly never mastered in a couple of years that I was running my financial planning business. But if I look at the kind of companies out there that are doing this really well now, right? So you've got guys like Glenn James with a very successful podcast. While he's no longer a financial planner, he has financial planners that he works with and they're all doing remarkably well, right? So you've kind of got this media channel on one hand and then the advisors on the other and then you've another times you've got um, Victoria Devine, who sort of uh, is no longer doing financial planning. But as as far as I'm aware, she's sort of doing courses and things like that. So, so she has a scaled approach to it. Then you've got people like uh, Ben Nash at Pivot Wealth, and he's sort of yep. all in-house. He does all their his own media plus. And it's almost become the, I would call it the, the new wave, right, of uh, financial planners that have been out for maybe the last 10, five to five to 10 years, something yep. like that. It takes a while, but goodness gracious, when that engine starts moving, it's actually very substantial, right? Like mm. the, those companies are some of the fastest growing. I think Ben's was even in the AFR's fastest growing 100 company, right? right? Like that's an insane sort of thing to, to yeah. achieve from a financial planning. And I'm not surprised because if you think about what they've done, they've worked so hard on the process and and yeah. the the onboarding of clients and and almost probably taken a similar view to what we've done. I think when we first met Clay, bring it back to the start of the conversation, <laughs> it felt like the industry was against each other, right? Yeah, sure. It was yeah. Advisors going, don't go to that advisor. I'm a yeah. better advisor. Oh, well, our firm is better than your firm, and it was very much siege mentality. Mm. Uh, I feel like our mm. uh, our industry has now pivoted. Um, well, there was a lot to figure out. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think now oh, I'm so happy when I hear people getting advice from other people and, you know, and, and for us, we'll, we, you know, if it doesn't fit our mold of the clients, I'm happy to recommend other professionals. And yeah. I think what we've done really well is you asked what, what's next in the marketing aspect. I think what we f- we focused on at the beginning, making sure that our processes or what we call the warehouse works really well. Yeah. So that you know, if we do go out to social media and we just said to each other, we said, well, you know, what about if 100 clients came through? Yeah. Could we service them right this second? Yeah. And 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 at that moment, it was an, a, a hard no. Sure, yeah. And it was about, well, how do we make sure that if we do go out there and, and, and they do come, how do we make sure that our systems, our processes, our onboardings, yeah. um, the guardrails are there from a licensee perspective? How do we make sure we are good fiduciaries and responsible managers? And how do we make sure that the advice business can stand on its own two feet? Yes. And that's why we took the time to really do a lot of due diligence, build it out, build the the infrastructure to make sure that when the, the 100 clients come through, we're ready and we can then almost onboard the next 100 yes. as quickly as, it, as, it, as the first came. So I think that's the biggest part. Marketing, uh, you know, what I would, you know, for the purpose of the podcast – don't try and do it yourself. 
I think the first mistake we did was we tried to do it ourselves, uh, and we realized we're, we're we're not professional in that sphere, and 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 took the core of who we who we are and, and who in Julian and myself are. We we insource professionals, right? We build teams around people. Yeah, well, you know when when someone comes into uh, to a meeting, we we ask who your team is and and the missing players in that team. We fill that team to make sure that you have the right professionals around you to solve whatever tasks that or challenges or, or aspirations in front of you to make sure you have the best uh, advice. You and ultimately yep. our goal is for you to be as informed to make a decision and make the most informed decisions so that you can take action. And uh, same for us, we we're going to insource people who are going to help our business grow. You know, and 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 with time, obviously, we're, you know, this is our first podcast. I hope it's uh, the first of many. With on yeah, talk about insourcing experts. You can you can uh, grab Kieran here and launch your own podcast, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that that that's the vision. I, and I think when, when when we look at marketing, it, it's such a behemoth because you have such great marketers out there. I think uh, we look to right now at the property industry right. and what they're doing and uh, how progressive they've become. You know, if you look at mortgage brokers or, or buyers agent advocacies, how they're marketing themselves. Yeah. Uh, because ultimately, let's talk about mm. uh, them. Uh, you, you don't kind of need them in the process. Of course. Right? Uh, for a lot of stuff, what we do, it, it's kind of like an intangible, but you you do need us for, for a lot of aspects and have access. Yes. But really, you can you can go buy your own home or yeah. some property or you can yeah. go get a, a loan from a bank without a broker. Yeah. So how they need to position themselves is quite interesting and fascinating in the current environment, how they create content, distribute content. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely something we're looking to to say, well, what are they doing and how how are they doing it? I, I've realized one thing, they're swearing a lot. <laughs> Not only they swear a lot, they get uh, – I watched a video once where I felt like with $10 in my bank, I could own 10 properties. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's that easy. Yeah, they're really good at that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and to your point, uh, you know, if we if we were to take it on the ASO's perspective, we really focus on people's income expenses and the risk profile, right? Mm. And, and if I were to take it a little bit deeper, we, we create horizons for clients, right? And those horizons are going to be, let's just call it benchmark to something or their goals. Yeah, right. And then we, we, we look at that aspect and say, well, what is your income doing? What are your expenses doing? And what's your risk profile telling me about you? And how can I actually achieve your goals and aspirations? And I think that's it's different to the approach that mm. you got the feeling of, you know, our process is far more diligent and 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 creates a lot of intimacy with and it requires a lot of intimacy because in our industry, ten dollars is not going to buy you ten yeah. properties. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. Um, Julian, what do you see as the vision, not only for ASO but for the profession? You know, beyond just your company. Yeah. Uh, well, there's something I wanted to touch on before, and I'll start with um, I'll start with the profession. Um, is like like what we said before, 10, 20 years ago, it was a very different world to what it is today. And today, it's a much more of a kind of a community group between advisors and um, and advice firms in the country. And I think it's I think it's awesome. I think that um, I mean, it's it's obviously uh, call it a blessing in disguise where. X amount of advisors left, we'll call it close to 15,000 advisors left the industry, which leaves us with somewhere between 13 to 15 at the moment. And, but what that means is there's, there's like all of a sudden the competition is very different and we are able to help each other. And one of the platforms that, um, that allows that is the Ensemble platform. Yeah. And, um, and it's actually been, it's really been awesome to see, uh, the app. And how, and just the way people ask questions on the app and the way people just give answers, they go, yeah, if you want, you know, he, he's my solution. He's what we do in our, like people are literally sharing their, um, their, um, kind of the way they do things or their yeah. processes in their business to help other people who, who are struggling. And so I, I, I see that as, I think that that's just, um, awesome. What does that mean for the future? Uh, it's hard to tell. I, I keep seeing reports, um, around, you know, advisors. I think it's stabilised at the exit. I think uh, maybe I might ask you that question. What you what you think from your from your lens? But what I'm what I'm definitely seeing is that new entrants are, you know, it's really really stagnant. And and what that yeah. what that means is we go okay. Well, how do we continue to fill the the gap for the demand? Yeah. Um. You know, in that space, 
and um, and how do we keep up? I mean, the whole other question is is technology and AI. That's just that's that conversation is not going to go away for a while now because it's going to change things dramatically. Yes. Um, so how do I? How do we see the future with that? Well, um, it's 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 hard to say, but I, th- you know, maybe this, this, the simplest way to put it is that it's probably uh, never been a better time to be a financial advisor, or, or at least to have a financial advisory business as well. Yeah, um, and um, and if you don't keep up with the trends, uh, you're probably going to lag. Um, so. So yeah, and look, what that means for us is that one of the best things is well, we're we're on the younger end of the spectrum or of the you know average advisor um, age, and we are we we you know consider ourselves progressive uh, and confident in our approach, which means that we we're aware we're always looking and we um, we can see kind of you know what's happening in the industry. And, um, you know, we're going to be working just as hard um, on servicing our uh, clients as um, kind of, uh, you know, working towards, you know, the process to keep not only to stay afloat, but to be a a cutting edge financial advisory firm in the future. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. I think there's a, I think um, everything you just said, I actually, have very strong opinions on and and that is i i think we need more people and i think it's never been a better time to be an advisor it was it it was annoying for a while yeah. there's no doubt you know especially from fofa sort of 2013 yeah. 2014 you know and then the royal commission and i mean it was just it was almost like the rules and regulations were changing and making things hard for the pure sake just to shift as many people out of the out of the profession yeah. as possible. That's kind of what it seemed like. And it all, it, there was a little bit of a, a sour taste in my mouth, you know, when they s- sort of in the latest round sort of started talking about they're going to unwind all these, you know, things that they did, right? It's almost like, well, a lot of effort went in yeah. to meeting them all and now it was all for naught. But pros and cons, I yes. guess. Um, it's lifted the profession and, and now hopefully going to make things a little bit easier. But um, one of the things that I'm definitely passionate about is getting more people into the profession. It's it, the big banks are out. AP Horizons, which I went through, is out, and uh, it's it's something that we would like to at Ensemble over the next couple of years play play a role. You know, as we spoke about when you guys first came in, you know, it it's going to go from conversation. You know, we've been doing education for a little while, but we're yeah. sort of making it official now with CPD, you know, the platform. But even that is just step one in terms of heading down this path. We we want to get much more involved in education. Yes. And we actually want to use that as a attraction mechanism into the profession um, and acquire them from other professions. If you think about nursing and nursing and accounting, the two that come to my mind, it's because I went through Horizons and I spoke to the team at Horizons a fair bit and I said, what were the best advisors, you know, the people that sort of did the best, had the best careers, added the most amount of value? They said, nurses that with math? I thought, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, you know, good bedside table manner, you know, the, yes. been through crazy conversations with, with people, right? So, nurses with good math and accountants with personality. And it was both the you know if you can sort of straddle that numbers and the and and the people aspect, then uh, then you were very then you could go on and be very successful. And there's a lot of disenfranchised accountants and nurses out there, and I think that they could smoke it in this industry. It's just everyone on this table on this podcast, everyone that we have as guests on this podcast, all have a unique story yeah. of how they stumbled upon. Financial planning. It's always a stumble upon. No no one, you know, in their year six, they're like, oh, I'm going to become a firefighter and a financial planner, right? Like, it's 100%. just, it's it's always, it's never a first drop uh, career path. It's always a second drop. But for those that find it, I mean, my God, like, no one gets into advice and says, ah, oh, I really wish I was back doing, you know, accounting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah. And look, uh, I'll just... Did a little quick, quick share of my story. It was it was at university, and I was doing bachelor of commerce. Um, and 
at University of Canberra, they go, uh, after year one, you do all your, your, your major stuff, like your, your structural kind of courses, and then they go, okay, what do you want to major in? And uh, I literally, the only reason I did it is I had a friend who said, yep, I um I did, like, this was really interesting. I did that. He's not a financial planner in the end, but uh, he said, I did a major in financial planning. And, no and, way. And University of Canberra was probably one of the few that literally majors in financial planning. Yeah. Uh, there are there would have been some, but not many. And then and I said, you know what, I'm interested. Let's let's go. And then that's literally how it happened, which was uh, my god. So, yeah. so your mate was like, yeah. I mean, it's got the word finance, and it can't be that bad. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's amazing. That's honestly yeah. amazing. What about you, Naz? Oh, <laughs> it's it's an interesting story because I wanted to become. <clears throat> uh, obviously, your parents send you to university, and you know, once that happens, they kind of go, okay, well, you're going to become someone. Uh, you know. You've, you've got to. I think it's the it's the it's the uh, migrant mentality. Going through it and 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 university and seeing people graduate. Uh, look, I wanted to become either a corporate lawyer or an investment banker. Uh, I, it, that was very much glorified to me as as the the titans of the industry. Mm. Uh, I was obviously doing two degrees, and for me, it was such a big thing to do either or either or. I, I became a paralegal for six months and hated every day. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't paid. You uh, you weren't paid. I was not. I was not paid. I was. I was. Well, got, corporate lawyers are always struggling. You know that. So, well, it, it, they told me they charge at twelve hundred an hour. So, wow. I, uh, I I thought to myself, well, if I gave up this time, it was all about the compounding interest right, aspect, yeah. right? Going, if I give up this time to then earn twelve hundred, yeah, no, an hour. Yeah. What, what, where would I be? Um, but. Yeah, I was I was a paralegal. Uh, I I didn't like what I was doing, and uh, investment banking. Once I learned what it was, again, didn't interest me as much as. And it really comes back to the core of 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 who we are with Julian, and 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 I think how I got into this industry is ultimately uh, my parents are first generation migrants, and you know their mentality around wealth creation was, you know. And my father still tells me to this day when he was buying our first family home, it was like, they just told me this was the mortgage. I figured out how much I had to pay in, 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 in groceries, how much I was making for the week, and could I make that repayment? And he did that religiously for 15 years. Legend. And, but they never had any other financial wisdom. Right. Sure. They, they, the, the, the system was so complicated and yeah, superannuation, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and being, you know, when, when they came, they, they, you know, super was not something that they were encouraged to contribute into. Uh, it was all cash, right? It was yeah. cash. <laughs> it's not about flashy cars or, 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 or nice watches. It was literally about, for my parents, it was about lifestyle. Um, it was about having the opportunity to, to send their kids to the school that uh, was safe, secure, and, and, and gave them a good education, having, you know, food at the end of the week for the family and, and, and having a really good and, and happy lifestyle for the family. And, but what I saw my parents struggle with is when, you know, you get to an older age and they say, well, I've, I've paid off the house, I've got this, but I don't really have anything for my retirement. Mm. And, and, and that really got me thinking, well, what's my purpose and all of this? And I genuinely wanted to, to help people like my parents, yes. right? And, and once you realize what the industry, what this industry actually does yeah. and how it empowers people yeah. and, and really – uh, teach people that the power of, of 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 leverage compounding and all these different things, it really makes a, a tremendous difference in people's lives, yeah. and and that's what really encouraged me to get into the industry. I, I heard someone speak, uh, then I inquired, and, and luckily I was I was taken upon as as a graduate. Um, oh, so you you saw someone speak while you're at uni? Yes. Wow, that's really rare, especially that both of you actually had made the decision to go into financial planning before you'd even left uni. Yeah. You well, I was in my last semester at Amazing. So I was I was doing two days of work. So Monday, Tuesday I was working and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday I was at university. Wow. And then graduated. Um and it was it was really, you know, again, the the, the happiness a part of that role. I, I was being paid. My previous yeah. payroll, I wasn't even being paid. Um, so, budget <laughs> planning does work. So it does work, um, and and it really helped me. You know, for, I, I remember the first day, um, and, and this is why I think in the industry we need to have labeling of who you are and who you want to be. Yeah, I'm a pretty strong believer in that as well. Um, and and you know, I sat in front of someone and he said, "What do you know about insurance?" 
And I said, well, home insurance, car insurance, is it no, no, what, life insurance? I said, no idea. <laughs> I only heard that about that stuff in the US and I really wasn't familiar with it. And then I, I sat with another advisor and he goes, what do you know about investments? And I was like, well, you know, I know stocks. And he goes, great, that's like one-tenth of the whole thing. <laughs> so you, you complete out of your depth. And yeah, uh, but but I, I had such a worldly view around being able to move around and sit with different advisors and learn. But and, and that's where the belief system comes from. Everyone needs to have a label. We we we, we label ourselves as strategists, right? right? To be able to be a, a personal CFO for someone, you need to be a strategist. You really need to awesome. have a game plan. Yeah. And, and that game plan then plays out into which directions you change. If certain things change in your in your life, in your circumstances, how do we pivot, adapt, yeah, and, and go on. Um, but there are people who who want to specialize in insurance or they want to specialize in investments mm. or asset allocation, and they yeah. should be called investment managers or yeah so like the medical industry right absolutely yeah i tend to agree yeah yeah Yeah. well yeah they should be known for what they're really good at that's That's right right. like a dermatologist is not a plastic surgeon no but they're both medical doctors yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. we we, we have had people who have come on who have sought advice in the past and it was actually last week and and then and and the lady said to me said oh well my advisor just does insurance and super and And yeah yeah and, yeah. and that's what they're really good at i really need someone to you know, I think I've reached a new stage in life and really want to. And so, you know, have you asked your advisor about it? So I have. Yeah. But he keeps talking to me about yeah. super and insurance. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Like early in my career, because that's all I knew as well. And someone said, Yeah, no, Clayton, thanks. But what can you do for me now? And I'm like, yeah. Have you heard of super regulation? <laughs> like when you, when you, when you've only got those tools, you're sort of limited. And, and it's not to, it's not to, you know, poo poo that. Those skill sets, Absolutely right? But, it, it was, but as soon as you start working with people that are looking for that thing today, it becomes rapidly clear that you need to do something else. And it's also uh, a business model. Some guys just yeah. want to focus on that because the whole processes are built around. That's and right. That's, and yeah. that's, you know, that's fine for them. Uh, but and for us, we we that's not where we see yeah. uh, the future of, of ASO um, and our skill sets, especially. Absolutely, I think you know, as going back to some of the the mistakes in the industry, some people just jump into that, right? The clients are asking about something else, and you're jumping into a, a, a solution, right? And not really understanding them. You're not really being truly intimate or giving them the comfort to really explain what they're here for. Yeah, you know, we really yeah. ask, what are you here for? First question, what are you here for? Yes. Great you question. What, where, do you, where do you want to land? Yeah. You know, talk to me about your horizons. Talk mm-hmm. to me about everything, right? And and really understanding, you start to go, well, let, let's draw this out. The other question I, 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 we ask is, if you never came to see us, what would you do? Oh. Oh, that's an interesting one. Why do you ask that question? It really goes back to the psychology of money. Yeah. Right, the book, or you, oh, just, just the psychology just of money, yeah, and yeah, really yeah. understanding. I, I am, I've picked up a lot of one-liners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's like you know, uh, to determine what their money mindset is, right? So, when my parents, right, my, my parents, when they came to this country, and and you know, my father-in-law, you know, almost, you know, there, there was about buying a home, yes. paying off the mortgage, yes, build a business, yes, right. But there's so many more aspects to life to that, right? For me, you know. Neither did my centers of influence have a corporate job, right? So for me, it was I was completely in a different landscape to anything that my family was around. Um, you know, my father was like, well, you, you hire five people, you just you run your own business. And I said, I'm in, I'm in corporate world, dad. That's not how it works. <laughs> um, but but it was it was really understanding that those those playing fields and and and, and being able to build on those aspects yes. was really really important. Oh, it's a great question. It, yeah, um, it, you're almost asking what's your default setting. Like, I guess it does tell you a lot about the individual. That's right. That's, that's, yeah, that's exactly. what their frame of reference is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some people have defaults, like the default oh, yeah. of what and, they go to. And yeah. it also tells you, the big one is it also tells you what their, it very simply puts another risk profiling metric because it tells yeah. you what their tolerance is. It's like, okay, well, I would have done... This and I'd can, invest in crypto versus yeah. I'd put it under the pillow. That's right. That's going to give you an answer. It tells you so many uh, Yeah, that's it tells, cool. It tells you that. It also tells you how much education you need to give them. Yeah. They said, I would have put, yeah. you know, 50% of my money into crypto. You go, okay, right. Hey, cool. Let's, okay, let's, let's, let's start there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And even yeah. things we, we ask around is like sensitivity to loss. So that's what we try to also determine. Right. Right. How much. So right. the, the default option of if, yeah. if something bad happens, what are you going to do? 
you're yeah. out. So we always go, well, what's your best case scenario if you never met us? Or or, or what have your friends told you to do? Yes. Right? A lot of people say, well, my, yes. my friends have told me. I've got a friend in that corporation, this corporation. That So ultimately we ask, w- what is your game plan? And they, and they tell us. And then we say, well, if it didn't go your way, in a situation, you know, through events. And a, a COVID was a, a great one. It was, we used to be asked, uh, when the market was at this level, what did you do? Mm. You know, and we met people and retirees who sold. Tough gig. Yeah. Right. And and we have- Classic people, story, but yes. tough gig. Right. Oh. Or, or we ask, you know, when, when someone comes with 10 properties. Yeah. Why did you get 10 properties? So I've got this buyer's agent who- who helped me? Told me I just need ten bucks in my wallet. Ten bucks. <laughs> um, I was like, <laughs> show me the game plan. No, <laughs> but 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 uh, we ultimately try and understand the psyche behind it. Yeah, and and, and then really understand what the game plan thereafter. Because sometimes we we find people who get to a certain stage and and we we and and the real where, where we really find where we're adding a lot of value is uh, this. This is what people say to us. I'm this age and I've done so well or I've done the best I can possibly do to this point. Yes. I now need help because yes. I need to protect, preserve, and I need to have now I, I have now a new dimension of wealth. Yes. And, and and when I say wealth, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about, you know, happiness, family, all those other things that comes with either having a successful business or having a, a successful relationship. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where real people focus that time and they really want that time back. And it, well, it, it takes, it actually takes a, a big person to say, hey, I was good at raising wealth or I was good at, yeah. you know, making something of my career and then doing or, or something with my business or career or whatever it was. But I don't want to ruin it. Right. Mm. Like I, like I know you, I've identified you have a certain set of skills that can help make my set of skills mean more because I don't want to do all this and then sort of, you know, drop the ball on, yeah. the, on yeah. the goal line. And the other one where where we do is is we were we were talking about this the other week is we also bridge the gap between partners, right? We will also find when we're doing risk profiling, we we actually do it separately and then we combine it and try and and, and, and actually communicate to say, well, this is what your psychology of money this is. This is what. Your psychology. And sometimes we find people who come from different paths of, of life and different relationships where they have common goals, but they have very different, uh, you know, money mindsets sure. right? and, and, and trigger points and, and, and building those bridges. And, 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 you know, I had, I had a funny story. We actually look after someone in the industry and he said, look, we, we've built enough wealth, but I now need you, Naz, to, to put your overlay, your process, your risk management, and I need you to manage it. I said, you're really smart. Dude, you're probably smarter than me and you know a lot more than me in investments. You know, why are you hiring me? That was my first question. And he said, look, we um, recently, uh, I invested some money and we lost 20% and I came home and my wife said, do not ever touch that bank account again. Yeah. We need help. Yep. Uh, I want to have, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want this to become the problem in our relationship. I genuinely want us to move forward. Yep. And uh, we need outside help. And uh, that's what has made his. He goes, my my family life and my home life has never been happier because we just talk to you, and obviously you give me the time and space to elaborate on what I'm good at. The partner gets to ask critical questions and 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 able to, you know, we can also deliver advice to her in a different way that we deliver to him. That's awesome. Um, and and they both then transcend into a, a, an equal platform of wow. Yeah, and there's something, you know, to add to that, the, you know, we, we talk about this a lot because people, when they come see us, they go, well, um, you know, what, what, like if I'm going to pay you, what's the, what am I getting back, you know, type, you know, this type of stuff. And what we like to say, and, and although it's not limited to three, um, we like to say that there are, and this is really important to, for people, you know, whether advisors or whoever it may be to, to, I think to, to grasp or remember, remember is the best word, is that there, there are, I think, you know, three main pillars to of value to financial advice. And one of them is, you know, by default is money made or saved or whatever it may be. That's that's quite uh, simple. Uh, but in cases where, um, you know, that's um, less so than other values, number two would be um, time saved. A lot of people forget that. They go, okay, well, hang on, they've just taken on 
they've just done all of this for us. That's right. Yeah. Like they've just taken on all this stuff and it's, it, you know, if I was to do it myself, it would take, you know, this much kind of, you know. Headache. Much, yeah. Headache time, all of it. And number three is is um, is simply peace of mind. And the reason I say all this is, you know, the, the example that Naz just gave before. It's like, well, the wife clearly wants peace of mind. Uh, and she's going, I don't care. You know, this is what, this is why we need the help of someone is to be able to um, have someone make these decisions for us and we just move forward with our lives and, you know, have weekends as a, you know, as a family, not not fighting for, for some money that we lose or may lose or whatever. It's priceless, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Gentlemen, we've got to say, I've had an absolute ball. Um, thank you so much for coming on and sharing what you have. I'm sure we could bloody do 10 more yeah. of these. Um, let's do it <laughs> why not um, so look if there's anyone that wants to reach out to you guys I mean you're both on LinkedIn or yes yeah absolutely LinkedIn our website ASO Wealth yeah we, we, we love to hear from from people and, and, and from industry as well uh, we love to learn and um, we really really appreciate this Clay this is this is a, is a big podium you're doing amazing things uh, I think you're one of the best advocates in the industry I'm really happy to know you and and and, and really, thank you to, to you and your team. And, and I can't wait to see you grow as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. 100%. Thank you.